Good morning, church. How many of you think freedom's a good idea? We're in a series in Exodus, finding authentic freedom. Can I just let me ask you a question? How many of you um, would just say that you have, in your time of walking with Jesus, um, have experienced authentic freedom in an area? And you don't have to go into what it is. Just lift your hand. I mean, just hold your, lock the elbow. Uh, you really, okay, now look around. I want you to look around. So, you with your hands up would say that freedom is possible for everyone. Would you agree that freedom is God's will? Jesus said, whom the Son sets free is free indeed, completely free. And so we're in this series. We just started last week, the book of Exodus, Finding Authentic Freedom. I love freedom. I know what it's like to be in bondage uh, to addictions. I know, what it's, I know what it's like to be an alcoholic. I know what it's like for 10 years to have a yoke around my neck and the desire to drink and the, and the complete wrecking of my body and my brain and relationships and cars and people and all. I, I know exactly what that's like. And I know what it's like to come to the throne of grace with confidence because God invited me there and to find total freedom from alcohol 37 years ago. 37 years ago, I've been free. Alcohol free. You know, so, you know, I'm here as one to just, to just tell you that um, God is all about freedom. You know, man made some choices in the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, uh, that were disobedient, were dangerous, uh, that alienated humanity, uh, that humanity failed. And now we get to Genesis, and you have God's rescue operation for the people of God. They've been enslaved. They've been, you know, eating the consequence of their sin. And now Exodus is all about God's rescue mission. The word Exodus means way out. Everybody say way out. It's the way out. It's where we get the word exit. It comes from exodus. Now listen, whatever you're going through right now, and it doesn't matter what area it is, it doesn't matter what realm it is, it doesn't matter how strong the, you know, the power, the grip that you think it has on you, I can tell you there's a way out. There's a, there is a way out. It, the guaranteed way out. Every week you hear people come and stand up and share their version of bondage and the destruction of sin and the encounters that they had and the process. And it's a process. You know, I was delivered literally on my knees from alcohol in the span of about a week and a half, crying out to God. And when it was done, it was done. But, the, but then the rest of the time is walking it out and working it out and then getting your mind renewed by the Spirit of God and by the Word of God. Now, the way out, now, this is, this, this is the, you know, in church, the, 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 the response to every question, the answer is always Jesus. You know, I mean, what, what did Jesus say? He said, I am the way. Not a way, not one of many ways. He said, I am the way. He is the way out of oppression. He's the way out of bondage. He's the way out of addiction. He's the way out of darkness. He's the way out of all those things that are the fruit of sin. But it's not just if you stop there, it almost suggests that religion is a, I just stop doing a bunch of things. But the way out of bondage is then the way into the presence of God which is really what it's all about. How do we walk with this God who calls us his people and whom we call God? And that's what Exodus is all about. And we're going to look at somebody named Moses. You ever heard of him? Charlton Heston. <laughs> Just wanted to see how many, what, what, what the age of the room was. So now we know we're older, okay? You ask that, you know, the youth kind of like, Chuck who? Char what? No, no, Charlton has, which I'm sure is exactly what Moses looked like. But we're going to look at this. Exodus chapter 3, verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, and the, pri <coughs> the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert, came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him. That's a, a theophany. It's a manifestation in the flame of fire from the midst of the bush. And so he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. You know, there's a place you are, and there's the place God wants you to be. And if you look at scripture, Genesis to Revelation, it literally is one long transition for the people of God. And it's, and it, and it's, and it's many transformations along the way. 
And we're going to see this, this timid and reluctant leader, Moses, and you're going to see God confronting him and coming to him and doing things for him. And, 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 and when you see this first thing, this is kind of the first, you know, leadership lesson for Moses, a burning bush that does not go out. And when, when I see that, you know, it, it really occurs to me that God will use anything and everything at his disposal to reveal himself to you. In fact, when you found God, probably wasn't just on some kickback, lazy day, enjoying life. It was probably in the midst of some kind of pain. It was probably in the midst of some kind of struggle. It was probably in the midst of some profound questioning about the origin of things, about God, about your purpose in life. Uh, He met you in futility. Futility of life was one of the ways that God met me, where life didn't make sense to me. Uh, Life seemed to be lived on terms of just getting pleasure, habitual pleasure, which led me to habitual emptiness and and spiritual and moral bankruptcy, which caused me to turn to God. And so, you know, the bush is just, you know, kind of a representation that God can and will use anything in our lives to speak to us. Uses all that kind of stuff. Verse 4, the Lord saw that he turned aside to look. God called to him in the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. Now, when God calls your name twice, you really pay attention. You know, there's eight, eight times in Scripture where God calls somebody by name twice. You know, Simon Peter, he said, Simon, Simon. The apostle, you know, Saul, you know, Saul, Saul. Samuel, Samuel. Martha, Martha. <laughs> so if God calls your name twice, Francis, Francis, you know, pay attention. Susie, Susie. Pay attention. You're going to Guatemala. You're going to be a missionary. (laughs) Moses, Moses. Oh, you shouldn't think that was funny. Okay, that's all right. And he said, here I am. And then he said, do not draw near to this place. Take off your sandals, off your feet. The place you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I'm the God of your father, God of Abraham, Isaac, God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he's afraid to look upon God. You know, when you think about your freedom, and most of you, had tangible experiences with getting set free by God. In retrospect, I I wonder, you know, how many people are on the other side ready to experience freedom because of your freedom? You know, freedom for one is not just freedom for one. God uses the freedom of one to bring freedom to a lot of people. See, I, I never knew, I never, I never grasped that when I was delivered from alcohol, you know, how big of a deal that was. I knew it was a big deal for me personally. I, I knew it was like a, a miracle from God. But I never knew then that God would use that as a redemptive tool in other addicts' life. And it was amazing. And, and, and the other day, I just jotted down how many countries I've been to. And I've been to 15 or 16 different countries. And 13 of those, I publicly shared my personal testimony about getting delivered from alcohol. And in every setting, there was a profound response of, of, of people who needed freedom. And so your freedom is never just for yourself. It is, but it's also for other people. Uh, and, and the way he wants that communicated is you tell your story, you tell your testimony. And you don't have to be perfect, you don't have to be eloquent, you just simply have to say, this is what God did in my life, leave it at that and let the Holy Spirit do it. I mean, it, this, that's part of, part of how we're wired, it's part of you know, the purpose of God in our life. Verse 7, the Lord said, I have indeed, now you're going to see the heart, you're going to capture the heart of God. I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about They're suffering. So I've come down to rescue them. And the reason, if you if you go, if you jumped over to to Exodus 6, you will see that God was going to set them free and deliver them so that they could be his exclusive people and that he could be their exclusive God. The, 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 The rescue was all about relationship, exclusive relationship. And he says, so I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians, bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, home of the the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites, and any other sites. sites. These are all people that that don't like God, and he's going to bring them to them. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I've seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. I mean, do you really get how much God loves you and is concerned about you? 
I mean, do you really kind of understand? I mean, I, it's one thing to go to a church and hear somebody talk or, or read scripture, but you have to understand that God has a redemptive heart for you, that, that he has heard your cries. And, and once again, I don't know why God delays answering some prayers. I, I really don't. Um, I could speculate, but I don't, I don't want to ruin it. But I, I, just, I just think that, that you and I really have to grasp the love of God for you. The love of God for you in spite of who you are. The love of God for you in spite of what you've done. See, your history doesn't really matter to God in the sense that it doesn't lock up his heart of love for you and towards you. I mean, that's, I mean you know, Jesus talked about this. It's not those that are well that need a physician. It's those that are really sick. How many of you were really sick before you came to Jesus? Yeah, really, that's the only way to describe it. Very, very sick. And so God says, I've seen it, I'm concerned, I've heard your cries. And then he says this, this is really, he says, I've come down to rescue the people. But then notice what he tells Moses in verse 10. So now go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Now wait a minute. <laughs> this is kind of a little bait and switch here. <laughs> the, the leadership bait and switch. It's like, God says, I'm going to come down and rescue. And Moses is probably thinking, wow, that's probably going to be pretty amazing. Wow, I just can't wait to see that. Wow, God, you're, you're talking out of a burning bush, and you're talking to me, and you're telling me your plan, and you're going to go do this great thing, and then all this he slips in, so I'm sending you. <laughs> it's like, how did we go from you're coming down to I'm going in? I mean, that's, isn't that just kind of interesting? God kind of, you know, kind of ropes us in sometimes. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Unbelievable. I thought you were going, oh, no, no. That's how we're starting. No. You know, if the Spirit of God dwells inside the believer, not just the church building, I think we have a responsibility to hear the cries of people in bondage. Uh, I don't think it's, I think we as the body of Christ with the Spirit of God should have ears to hear what God is saying, but also what are the cries of people? and not ignore them. You know, once, here's, here's what it looks like. I have good friends that live in Greece. Uh, he works for the State Department, and somehow on a day off, they found 700, 1,700 Kurdish refugees uh, that have escaped out of Syria and Iraq and all those places, and a lot of them have, have lost whole family members or some family members. And so last Sunday, they FaceTimed LaDonna and I, and they just said, hey, look, here's the situation. There's 1,700 Kurdish refugees that are in just chain link fence with little, um, just these little mini trailers, and they have absolutely nothing. Would you pray about coming and just doing something? Now, here's the deal. It's either yes or no. And, there, and, and, and nobody can meet all the needs of everybody. We get that. But I'm responsible to, for what I'm hearing. I'm responsible for what kind of cries are getting through this head and this heart. And what is God's heart for that particular people? I've never been to Greece. I've never been around Kurds. I don't know what the deal is. But I, I got a feeling that when I go, um, it's going to be intense. And, and so, you, I mean, we have to look at this, man. There's people crying out all over the planet. And you and I are not just called to live this little American dream Christian life where we just go about our business. But we, we're to walk around and decipher and discern, you know, who's crying what? That's, I mean, who's crying? I don't, I don't, we don't have the, the luxury to just kind of go, well, that, you know, that's the UN's problem. That's the, you know, that's the European Union. Not, yeah, not, somebody else will do it. I, I, you know what? I don't, after walking with God, you don't, we don't get that kind of stuff. We got to pray. So pray for us. I'm, you know, planning on going to India to see our friends there and then going to take three or four days, swing down there, uh, 10 hours by flight, swing down, just going to swing on down there, 10 hours, then four hours, then another hour up into the mountains. And you know what? I don't know what I'm going to encounter, but somehow there's a response required from me. There's a response required from the church. It's all about relationship. And so, you know, this, hmm. You know, the parallel verse to this, I mean, here's the, here's the heart of God in Exodus as he is, he is the way out for people in bondage. The parallel verse would be in Matthew chapter 9. It's the same thing that goes on. Jesus sees the multitudes 
is moved with compassion and then heals them. That's the parallel verse right there. God sees, God hears, God goes, God knows, and God is going to, in grand fashion, rescue them. And Jesus, the same right there. Moses actually is a type of Christ. And so that's what happened. So how is he going to do that? You know, the Bible says Jesus is the shepherd and overseer of our soul. But now, how is God going to do this? Well, he's going he's gonna, to he's gonna call a guy. He's going to call a guy named Moses to do this. And he's going to bring freedom through a man. Let me ask you a question. Don't get hung up on this. But how many of you know that the freedom that you're experiencing right now in some part is because God set a person to you to minister on his behalf? No, God does move outside. Like when I was delivered from alcohol, it was me and God and the Gospels. There was, no, there was no people. There was nobody. But most of the time, God uses people to set people free. Now, here's, what's, here's what God is going to do with Moses first. And this is what God wants to do with all of us. He needs to deliver the deliverer. See, Moses has got some hang-ups. <laughs> okay, you know what? We're going to see. He's, he's a very uptight individual. And God has got to deliver him first to deliver the children of Israel. Moses, though, has some reluctance. Moses has a few excuses. I want you to think about maybe excuses that you've made that encroach on your personal freedom. What excuses have, have you made? Moses, God is going to go face-to-face, one-on-one, and this, this is called a leadership intervention. Okay, so here's what happened. So Moses is going to give some excuses. And here's the first one. Who am I? (laughs) Verse 11. Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Who am I? That's honest. And you know what God's going to do in these five excuses? He's going to meet Moses right where he's at. And it's really important to see that because if you look at God through the lens of legalism and harshness, especially in the Old Testament, you'll miss the grace that God operates in. It's just really easy to see God is black and white, cut and dry in the Old Testament. But no, if you continue to just look, you will see God's heart. In, in, in Moses, he is going to meet him face to face. And he's going to meet him with grace. And just he's really going to deal with him just as he is. Who am I? Okay, you ever ask that question? Who am I? That's the identity question. Who am I? See, Moses used to know who he was. He spent 40 year, years, 40 years as a prince in the palace of Pharaoh. You remember that story? Okay, well, what happens? He has a bad day. He kills an Egyptian, buries him in the sand, freaks out because it's known, heads out miles and miles and miles away, just hooks up out there with Jethro, meets a woman, gets married, gets some sheep. They're not even his own, just some sheep. And for 40 years, the highlight of his day is the sheep are eaten. There they are. There's the sheep. One, two, three. There. Yeah, they're all here. You know, I mean, he he was he was begging for an animal to come and attack, just to like you know spice up the day. I mean, forty years, man. You're just you know just leading a bunch of sheep, doing nothing in isolation and obscurity and solitude. But you know what? God's watching the whole thing. And so Moses starts out 40 years thinking, I know who I am. I'm royalty. I'm a prince. And oops, I'm a murderer, and I'm on obscurity, and I have got the worst profession on the planet. And I have got nothing but futility. i got nothing going on. And then God appears to him right then and there. And so Moses says, you know, who am I? Who am I? I should go to, to Pharaoh. Here's the deal. You need to understand this. God always works with what is, not what was. He is, he is dealing with Moses on the basis of who Moses is at that moment. And who he is is a very insecure guy. And he meets him right there. Verse 12, I will be with you. You want to know what the answer to just about everything is? The presence of God. The answer to every fear is, I will be with you. What, what did Jesus, Jesus emphasized it. Lo, I am with you to the end of the age. I will never leave you or forsake you. What we have is a paying attention problem, an awareness problem. 
If he's there, and he is by the Spirit, in fact, he, he told the disciples, I have to go away. If I don't go away, the Holy Spirit doesn't come. I want you to have the, my eternal presence with you and available to you all the time. So that was his response, God's response. I'll be with you. It's about presence. If you don't know how to do that, I mean, I know you can hear people and just talk about different, you know, how they practice that or how they do it, but I will just tell you, you know, for me, when you get in the, in the middle of worship, you sense the presence of God. You do. You put, I, will, I will put worship on just for extended periods of time and just let it just be there. Just be there with God. Tomorrow night, house of prayer will be going from 5 to midnight. You can just come in for 10 minutes. You can come in for five hours, do whatever. Come in, and you can just sit. You know, the first time I went to a house of prayer, I fell asleep. <laughs> and it wasn't because the music was bad at all. I, what it was was I was so religiously busy I was tired, and so I went in, and I thought, okay, I'm going to assume the meditative pose. <laughs> and then it transitioned into the, the meditative drool. You know, and it was like, and then all of a sudden, I'm conscious that people might be watching me, you know, that, wow, you can't do this. You're in a house of prayer. You're going to, you know, pray Jesus. I'm going after stuff right now. You know, where's my Bible? And pacing back and forth. And I'm just sitting here, man. My eyelids are so heavy. So I went with it. I just conked out, you know, just did the twitch, did all that kind of stuff. And you know what? When that, and that was about, about an hour, and I'm not an app taker, but when I was done, I felt like the Lord said, you know, guess what? It's totally okay to rest. I never knew that because I got the perform thing down. I got the conscientious thing down, be conscientious. I didn't have the, it's okay to drift off and worship in the presence of God. So, you know, I've never felt guilty about that. I feel awkward about the drool. Yeah, I get that. But, you know, that's, it's totally okay. So, excuse number two. He says, so he goes, who am I? Then excuse number two, he goes, what do I say? Well, these are great questions. These aren't bad questions. These are great questions. Verse 13, Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites. I say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask, what's his name? What do I tell them? You know what? And God meets Moses right where he's at. Here's the deal. The more you study the nature and character of God, the more you realize that God is never intimidated by the coexistence of faith and doubt in your life. Now, I came from a camp that, man, you couldn't make a ne you could not say anything negative about anything. Yeah, I mean, literally, if, if you said, oh, man, I got a headache. It's a symptom, brother. No. It's a real headache. <laughs> I swear to God, it's a real headache. No, brother, it's a lie of the enemy. He's not lying this time. It's real. But no, there, that was the environmental grooming that went on. You could never be honest. And so what it created was a bunch of religious fakers. You could never say, you know, it's like, you could never say you had a problem. You could never say you had a pain. You could never say you had anything. You just had to, you had to play this, like, shell game. But I'm, t I'm telling you, the more I study the nature of God, he, he, would, he doesn't fall off the throne because you got some doubt. Right. Are you kidding me? He remembers our frame, and we are just dust. Yeah. You know, Moses, Moses is being completely honest. He's going to have some faith. He's got some doubt. They coexist. And I would say, if you're honest with yourself, on your best day, you believe God supremely to do great things and awesome things. And on your worst day, where is God? And those two coexist. And so we feed our faith, yes, and we starve our doubt, and we bring what we have to the table, and God knows what to do with it. God always has a response. That's the great thing. Verse 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. What? I'm, so I'm going to tell him, I am who I am sent me. <laughs> who is this God you talk about? I am who I am. He sent me. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's just kind of, wow, I am who I am. What's he saying? It, the I am of God is... The otherness of God, the self-sufficiency of God, the God that needs no one, the eternally self-sufficient, self-existent one. That's what you're going to say, Moses. 
I am has sent me to you. Excuse number three. Suppose they won't believe me. Moses answered, what if the people don't believe me or listen to me? And they say, the Lord did not appear to you. You know, isn't it interesting when we play the what if game? How can we always play it on the negative side? Why do we always play it the, well, what if this happens? And what if this happens? Why isn't, what if it does happen? Well, you know, I, I'd pray for more people, but what if it doesn't work? What if it does? <laughs> I'd, I'd share my faith more often, but I just don't think they really want to listen to me. What if they do? <laughs> no, I, I'm seriously, you know, I mean, ch- check attitudes. You know, listen for attitudes. Oh, you know, I, 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 I went to marriage counseling. You know, I did. Oh, this is, he's never going to change, blah, blah. You know, what if he does? What if, what if you do? It's two people. Probably leave that alone here. <laughs> See, our life is really all from faith to faith, glory to glory. So whatever faith you have now, whatever faith you've used right now, whatever faith God has exercised through you, there'll be other mountains. There'll be other, there'll, there'll be other landscapes. There'll be other people in bondage. There'll be other things. And it's from glory to glory, from the weight and weightiness of God to more weight and weightiness of God. That's, that's who we're supposed to be. That's how we're supposed to live. And, you know, Moses, I mean, really, you know what it is? It's future tripping. You know, it's, it's that wicked imagination, worst case scenario. It's amazing how, how quick we can go there. But Moses, or God meets Moses right where he's at. And then once again, this is everything God does for Moses, we have to assume is what Moses needed. Because God knows what's going on, right? I mean, he, he knows what's going on. So everything, all these interactions are because God knows what Moses needs. I would say that's true of you and me also. He, you know, get used to the big ask for God. Ask God to do big things. Ask God to do radical things. Ask God to do just things that are so beyond you. Get, get into that kind of realm. That's the realm we're supposed to live in. And, and he said, you know, here's what the Lord said to him. What's in your hand? A staff, he replied. Okay, ordinary stick, shepherd's staff. Lord said, throw it on the ground. You know what happens. Throws it on the ground, turns into a stake. snake. Moses runs from the snake. Can't wait to see the replay. <laughs> What's in your hand? It's a staff. Throw it on the ground. Boom. What? <laughs> Burning bush faced dialogue with God. God is speaking to you. God's confronting you. God is listening to your excuses. Oh, yeah, your hand. Put your hand in your pocket. Okay. Boom. Pull it out. Leprous. What? Put it back in. Healed. What? Take some water. You got some water? Yeah, I got some water. Pour it on the ground. Blood. What? (laughs) Correct me if I'm wrong. God's going out of his way to show Moses that he's really God. God will go out of his way to show you that he is really God. Always has and always will, based on what you need. I mean, I always go to Thomas, favorite character, Doubting Thomas. You remember what he said? You know, they said, the Lord's risen. He's back. No. You know, you know what? Else? I put my hand on his side, touch his nail piercing. I'm not even going to believe. Eight days later, eight days later, Jesus walks in the room. Thomas. Ah. <laughs> and he says, peace, because apparently Thomas is probably going to lose it. Peace. Reach. Whoa. And that's the doubter. He did that for the doubter. How many of you have doubts? Guys, be honest. Don't, don't. You have doubts. Got him. He can handle your doubts. Ask him to do stuff. So he's doing crazy stuff right here. Question your doubts. Number four, four and five. I'm not a good speaker. I'm not a good speaker. Moses said, Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past, nor since you have spoken to your servant. I'm slow of speech and tongue. Okay, as if a good speech can deliver three million Jews. No, once again, that's, you know, the crazy zone people get? You know, like, oh, I don't know how to talk, you know, because I'm sure there's some kind of eloquent speech that if I just, oh, let his people go. Okay, Mo, they're gone. I mean, really, there's some kind of, you really think there's, I mean, you're so locked up in your fear and insecurity that you just think, 
Man, there's got to just be this magic speech. Google, best speeches for deliverance. I mean, really? No. No, but God meets him where he's at. And I love this. Now go, I will help you speak and teach you what to say. That's good. I'm going to help you. It's all good. Now, you know what's interesting? This is maybe some of the greatest tensions you live in, because I live here too, and that is the tension of what God says about me, his word and his heart about me, and then the inner monologue that goes on in my own head. You see, because it's interesting that Moses says, Man, I can't talk. I'm slow. Some say he was a stutter. We don't have time to go into that whole thing. But, you know, whatever it was, like, there's no way I'm giving a public speech to Pharaoh. I'm not going to do it. It's not happening. It's funny because when you jump over to the book of Acts and Stephen gives his first and last sermon, he recalls the history of Israel. And in it, he describes Moses as a man of powerful speech and powerful deeds. Okay, that gap between what really is and what I really feel about it is what has to be challenged by the Word of God. What's fact? So he's, he's got that thing kind of messed up. Excuse number five. Please send someone else. <laughs> Please, 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 that's someone, not me, please. He said, please, please, I don't want to do it. You ever, you ever been so afraid to do something, you chickened out? You, you ever been there? Please send someone else to do it. And the Lord's anger burned against Moses. But once again, he still meets him where he's at. He says, what about your brother Aaron? I think, okay, so what what about the anger of God? Well, my word. You can just see from God's perspective. I lit the bush on fire. I talked out of the bush. I was in the bush. Well, you and I are talking back and forth. You're, you're, You're giving questions. I'm giving answers. You know, we're getting closer, Mo. We're getting closer. And then you come up with yet one more excuse and ask me to send someone else. You know, God could have just said, goodbye, Mo. (laughs) It's over. Mo means over. You know, but he did. And he said, all right, you know what? I'm going to meet you where you're at. You need some help. You don't trust me. Where's your brother Aaron? We're going to send him. You know, one time... (laughs) <laughs> this is embarrassing. I was up in, in Washington. I don't even think I told Francis this ever. Um, Francis came up and spoke like once a year at my church in Washington. Well, the church grew. I mean, it was just growing and growing. And man, I was just, the more it grew, the more intimidated I got. It was absolutely frightening. You know, it's like I would be on, on my face in worship looking behind the rows of chairs, looking at all the people's feet and thinking, who different people were. And I'm thinking, I have got, there is no way should I be talking to these people. And there's just this fear. It's all the same kind of stuff right here. And, and so church is growing, it's growing. Then Easter comes and we start having all these people and all these people. And then one year it was like 1,000 and then it was 1,500. Man, it was seriously, it got rocky. And then the next year, you know, people said, you know, it looks like there's going to be 2,000 people here. You know, so we rented out this gym, and, and it was like, I was so stinking scared. I called Francis. I said, hey, I think you should come speak uh, Easter Sunday. I think, the, I, think the Lord, I think the Lord's telling me that you should come and speak Sunday. He goes, really? Let me check my schedule. You know, be, beads of sweat are coming down my, my deal. He goes, yeah, I can do that. I said, awesome. <laughs> you know? And I'm telling you, man, and, and that gym was packed, and there was 2,000-plus people in there, and I was looking, I just thought, I'm so glad Francis is here. <laughs> but it was a total wimp out. It was a total wimp out. I was so stinking scared. And, but you know what happened after that? God said, okay, you know, you get that one pass. 
You get a pass. I'll give you a pass. And it was good. Francis did great. Church went on. It was awesome. But, you know, next year came around, same thing. There's no wimping out of that one. It's like, Francis, nah, forget it. I got to face the music. So, anyways, Pastor Francis is back from Guatemala. Him and Susie got back from Guatemala. Want to hear what went on, what's going on, Guatemala. Thanks, Bob. I do remember these phone calls. Francis, this is Bob. And uh, he'd begin to share whatever the story was. But uh, I was always incredibly blessed to go and to see what God was doing. And God did great things during that season. You know, Susie's in the first row, so I'm always a little nervous. And... um, but it is uh, a joy. I'm still in jet lag, too, so I'm thinking, man, I'm, I'm in a different time zone. But uh, Bob and I did not talk about the Moses message, but it really it fits to what happened. In October, these two Hispanic uh, pastors from Guatemala came up, and um, I heard uh, through my uh, uh, assistant, Lydia, uh, these pastors are coming, and they want to talk to you, so she set it up for me to meet them in Starbucks. And I knew them from many, many years ago, but then I heard that they wanted me to go to Guatemala again and do a series of meetings, they had a whole like litany of things they wanted me to do. And I'm literally driving to Starbucks and I'm thinking, how can I tell these guys, you know, I've not been there in 30 years, I know we had an incredible time, it was awesome. We'll always remember Paris, it was awesome, but I got nothing. I mean, 30 years later, I, I saw the list of what they were looking for, and so, you know, who am I? What can I say? Who else can go? Those are all the thoughts that were going through my mind. So literally, I'm arriving there, and I'm not thinking about, I can't wait, you know, to hear what, what's going to happen. I'm thinking, I'm going to tell them this, and I don't want to be embarrassing or be hurtsome, but I'm just not going to go. So all of a sudden, I'm there, and um, they just begin to share their hearts, and all of a sudden, God says, well, you could share that, and you could talk about that, and you could do this, and Oh, okay, and then finally I'm kind of making a list, and then I get sucked in. All of a sudden I'm saying, I could come, and, you know, they have a board. They have a university with 14,000 students, and so they want me to address all the deans. I do deans, absolutely deans. I'll do a lot of deans, you know. Usually I'm 20, 30, 40 deans is my typical morning, but anyway, so... (laughs) So, and then all of a sudden I begin to share. Yeah, I could share about how Christian principles have transformed nations. And, you know, I'm just espouting these things as if I know something about that topic. But anyways, but thank God I Googled best speeches. That's what I Google. No, I'm, I'm a bit overstated. But so then they, they say, you know, bring your wife. Why don't you do a marriage seminar? I mean, literally, they listed these guys were going to suck every ounce of life out of me. And so they had 15 speaking engagements. I mean, literally 15 times. So Susie and I, and again, she was not excited either. So, uh, (laughs) but I had promised Susie 30 years ago that there's a beautiful spot in Guatemala. Sweetheart, I've been there a number of times in the 80s. I would love to take you there. But it was, you know, wishful thinking. But all of a sudden, um, she says, yes, she'll go. And so we did this marriage seminar. I'm going to show you pictures in a minute. But we did a marriage seminar. And, you know, Honestly, doing translation, uh, I've been to 20 countries. I never felt, I'm kind of hyperactive. I'm from New York. I talk quickly and waiting for a translator. Can we hurry it up a little bit here? In, in my youth, in particular, it was just very like talking to them about this. It just drove me nuts. So, But now I'm older, I actually liked it because the pacing was closer to my brain speed at this point. So it was, I really did. It's like first time in my life. I really like translators. Uh, but the response from the marriage seminar, I mean, there's about 100 leaders. These are from Costa Rica, Nicaragua, Guatemala, El Salvador. They're leaders of nations uh, and pastors. They've got 140 churches in their stream. And so, but we were stunned at the response at the end of it, uh, what these couple did. So just play that video. It really is incredible what took place there. When they came out of the hotel like that, they were older, older couples, but they just began to dance in the streets. And it was just incredible. We've never had that response in any of our marriage seminars before. Actually, as you may have picked up, that was not 
the response. But this was in a city called Antiqua, which was the city I wanted to take Susie to. I we're walking down the street, and there they are. These uh, they had these old folks that like doing this. Anyway, you can stop that and turn the lights up again. I hope. Anyway, that was a little bit of humor. Hope you guys can handle a little bit of humor there. But the marriage seminar was great. Um, we then, you know, they, they did ask me to talk to, this is the next picture. I'll show you. This is a genuine picture. These are the deans uh, of this university, and I talked about how Christian principles transform nations. Let me just say this to you in life, guys. This morning I said to Susie, this, I'm not aware of Bob's message. I'm not aware. I know I'm going to be talking about something, but I said, you know, honey, how it's amazing, even after a great experience, I'm still battling with fear, insecurity, hopelessness, doubt. And I said, you know what, sweetheart? I, I just got to deal with my little brain here because God's done enough in my life. Let's be really candid. How many of you would say God's done enough in your life? I mean, seriously, come on, stretch it out. God really has. It isn't like any of us have been deprived, shortchanged. He's been good. He's been faithful. But I don't know why on another morning you wake up and you're going, I got nothing. I got nothing. I can't face this. I don't know how to do this. I don't know what's ahead. It's just life, you know. It really is. So I did it. It was a good meeting, you know. It was a good time. We then, we did address leaders. Now, these are, you know, the, the boomer generation has been holding on in a lot of nations. And by the way, if you're wondering, you know, where are the young people? We've got hundreds of young people up at camp, you know. We have extricated them from the congregation for the weekend, and they're having a blast, you know. But um, I'm always grateful when there are young people in the room because, because I, I want that. I want to know there's a baton. And I did a, a generational message where they asked me, okay, talk to us about passing on a generational baton because we're struggling with that. So I showed them pictures of relay races where uh, there's 10 meters and a line and 10 meters. And if you don't, in that first 10 meters, get that in the hand of the next generation, if you will. And I showed them pictures of hands out and, and a baton in midair. Not a good picture, okay? That baton should not be in midair. I showed them a picture of a, a foot crossing a line and still reaching out but the baton's not in the hand. And so I challenged the leaders. And again, I'm just giving you a little highlight. Insecure, I can't do it, have nothing. They said it was the most significant set of meetings in 10 years. Give God, give God a glory for that, that's awesome. Because I still wake up insecure, okay? It isn't like, and the next morning, I was Samson. No, I felt <laughs> inadequate in myself. Then they, they, you know, they, it was never meeting that they said, we want you to address all the women's leaders. Women's leaders, absolutely. I'm, I've been a women leader for years. <laughs> Just with what I do. So, so then they, the, the, this is the presentation of women's leaders. And, you know, I had shared, but I actually did a message during the marriage seminar of understanding women. And Sudi had, had to approve it, you know, because I'm an expert. I really know. I mean, and the first line is, there are no experts, okay? Women aren't even experts about understanding women. But anyway, we did help them, encourage them. Uh, and then we saw interns. These are all interns that were living here. We, these are interns that once attended our internship. These are now leaders in Guatemala. Uh, Ana uh, Anako uh, is a beautiful lady there. Uh, she runs marathons. La Laura Cadera is head of the Destino a program with one of the leaders in their internship. Uh, then we have uh, Sophia. Sophia was magnificent. Gift to us, then that beautiful blonde there. She's a Guatemalan. Oh, Susie, I'm sorry. That's cute. <laughs> Me there. Then there is Andy. Uh, and then Ana Gabriela helped put all the slides together. She's also a key leader there. Uh, then there's uh, Boris and Pedro. And Edward is in charge of the internship. Well, these are young people that got trained up here and were sent down there. The next picture then shows them leading a Destino internship down there. They were trained up here at the Rock. We sewed into their lives. Give God a hand for that, okay? So uh, I was there celebrating their 10-year anniversary. And again, every meeting you walk in going, I got nothing. God, you're going to have to show up. It's your, your increase. Because I'm not feeling I'm capable 
with a millennial generation who are already distracted to begin with, hello, have you noticed that at all? Anyway, where they're all at camp, so don't tell them I said that. But anyway, uh, I, I'm going to share through a translator. And finally, I just invited them to come up and share a testimony of what God was speaking to them about. Then the, the highlight was a large meeting uh, where we invited, and that's me there in the middle like that, uh, invited another generation. They asked me again how to share, how to call out the next generation. And 400 young people came forward on the stage. It was powerful. Old generation came forward, prayed over them. A baton is being passed. I showed them pictures of us as hippies, okay? I showed pictures of a group that went to Guatemala in 1976, after an earthquake where 30,000 people were killed, and 15 hippies from Gospel Outreach went down, and they are your grandparents because they left America to go to a country they've never been, speak a language they've never spoken, drove through Mexico, through Latin America for three, four days, and arrive at a place. Now there's 140 churches there. And when I showed the picture of us and of others, I said, do these look like people that are promising? I mean, do you feel like, can't wait to see what they're going to do? And, and, and so I was encouraging the, the older generation to believe in the next generation, the next generation to believe in who they're called to be. Uh, then I spoke at a church there in Antigua, had a wonderful time, and then Susie and I, I took her to the place I promised I'd take her to, uh, in front of a volcano. Susie grew there. It was amazing. She just became, <laughs> got taller just being there. But there are, <laughs> Lo, I'm with you always. Anyway, so that's a little, there are two volcanoes in this town. One is it's called the Aqua Volcano which, and this town goes back hundreds of years, there was a lake on top of that that over time got so large, it eroded and a mudslide came down and destroyed a whole village. Thousands of people were killed. That's the aqua volcano. But then there's also the fuego volcano, which is a fire volcano. So right in town, the fuego volcano continues to erupt. Uh, that is a little bit of stuff coming out of there in addition to clouds. But they talk about, they... Uh, they talked about pictures uh, recently where the town was covered with three inches of ash. Uh, and they have pictures of the volcano breathing out lava. But they live, they get used to a certain thing. Anyway, I just wanted to say um, that each one of us in our lives, you know, Exodus is a way out. And I just want to provide an opportunity. Uh, I, because I said that to my wife this morning. And I hadn't heard Bob's message. I, he had told me a couple of days ago the name of Exodus. I had forgotten that it meant the way out. Um, but I did feel that this morning. I, you know, God, I know enough. I get up really early in the morning, okay? God, I know enough. I know. And part of, part of me just gets really embarrassed because it's like, Francis, come on. You know, snap out of it, buddy. God's been faithful to you. He's been good to you. And one of my great goals in life is to leave the planet really believing him. <laughs> I mean, is that like, that's a large goal, Francis. Well, yeah, it's a large goal. I want to leave the planet believing him, trusting him fully. I think that's the point of all the tests. So I want you to stand right now. I just want you to consider, you know, some of you guys need a way out. A way out of fear, a way out of discouragement, way out of depression, way out of lies. You know, part of this is appreciating what God did, but from my emotional experience, that was a long time ago. <laughs> uh, that was last week. Uh, it just feels like a long time ago. When I woke up this morning, it didn't feel like last week. That felt like old news. But I want us just to respond to the Holy Spirit. What does God want you to believe for? What, what are you, where are you stuck? And you need to believe that he's got a way. He makes a way where there is no way. He makes streams in the desert. You think God is ever concerned about any of our issues going, well, that's, that is pretty big, Francis. I do see why you're concerned. I mean, ooh, I can hardly look at it myself. It's a joke. 
He's grooming kids. He's raising children to trust him. And he wants us to trust him. So whatever it is, I just want you to, um, as we reach out our hands to him, to say, God, you know, I trust you. Come on, I trust you. Forgive me for not resting in you, not enjoying the ride, not believing you. Forgive me for giving into fear and unbelief and doubt and insecurity and frustration. Gosh, what has to happen in my life? What else do you have to do? You've been good to me, Lord. You've been faithful to my life. And I'm speaking to me. You know, all of us have to understand I'm being prepared for greater challenges ahead. Do you ever see really, really old people? <laughs> Don't look around right now. <laughs> but they got greater challenges. You know, you hang around old people and they talk about where their body's hurting and, you know, or just pain and loss and lack and insufficiency. And I don't want to be this little grumpy old man. I, I want to be a guy who's trusting God and faith. You know, I want every one of us in this room to believe that our best days are ahead. I believe that. I believe that. I'm going to live forever. But beyond eternity or before eternity, I, I want to be the guy who's, you know, what is he so happy about? Because he's trusting God. What is he excited about? He's trusting God. He's thanking God for today. He's reminiscing of all the Lord has done and enjoying the memories of God's faithfulness. And maybe you've never seen God move. And again, I did look around the room a few minutes ago when I said, haven't you seen his faithfulness? And some folks were sitting on their hand. And I'm sorry that you missed it. <laughs> but on the videotape replay, you'll see it. And you'll realize he was faithful in your life. He, he was faithful. He was faithful. You know, a lot of the diligence that was worked in my life was in horrible boarding schools, <laughs> in oppressive environments that worked discipline in my life. It makes me the man I am today. It makes you the woman you are today. Let's stop whining about what we don't have and thank God for what we do have and see what he has done. So, Lord, we reach out our hands before you, Lord. And again, I'm, a, I'm embarrassed. I wish I didn't have to say that I questioned you this morning. Part of me doesn't like that. It, it's humiliating. I should know better. But I, I have to acknowledge that I still am trying to train my soul. I'm trying to raise up me to be the man I want to be. I want to be that man. I want to be that man. And so, Lord, forgive me. And I'm just going to lead us in a prayer right now. And to whatever extent this hit you, you know, I think about Moses, the very end of his life. You know, next week I talk about, uh, I continue this journey in Exodus. But Moses didn't get to go in the promised land. I just think of him squatting on that hillside. You know, he got angry. He should have known better. He struck the rock. He got angry. And he got to reflect on it. It's not, you know, it wasn't a deal breaker. He still, I believe, will see Moses in eternity. But, but my responses, my reactions, my unbelief, my doubt, my fear has consequence. It has consequence for me, for my family, for my kids, for my grandkids. I want to be the man I'm called to be. I want to remember the faithfulness of God in my life. I want to know the Lord is good and proclaim that. Not fixating on what I'm not or where I think he may have missed me. He's never missed me. He's never stopped thinking about me. He's never not been working on my behalf. He's preparing. He's grooming me. He's making me for all that's ahead. So, Father, I pray for these dear ones as they're about to pray a prayer that's got to be a confession of their own heart. I pray that they today would reach up through the clouds, reach up through the fear and doubt and unbelief and discouragement and whatever mosquitoes they're swatting, Lord, because they are nothing. They're mosquitoes compared to the truth of your love and your faithfulness. And we pray this prayer. We're going to pray with conviction from our guts. Would you pray out loud, Heavenly Father, I trust you. You have given me a way out of the challenges I'm facing. 
You're bigger than they are. And so we trust you today. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me, for dying for my sins, for having my sins piled on you and bleeding out to rescue me. I thank you for this day you have made. Lord, bless the young people at camp, Lord. In a mighty way, God, let them come back fired up, God, as mighty twigs under our old wet logs to make us burn hot for you. In Jesus' wonderful name. And, Lord, I thank you I don't have to use an interpreter today. <laughs> Amen.